All right. 416. Let's see how we're doing here. 71. Looks like most people are back. Excellent. So it's abs my absolute pleasure now to formally introduce Dr. Maria Woodward, who is an associate professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences, uh, service chief and fellowship director of the Cornea External Disease and Refractive Surgery Service, um, as well as the strategic director um, at the Kellogg Eye Center for eHealth at the University of Michigan. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Science at Yale University, followed by a Doctor of Medicine at Columbia, Ophthalmology Residency, where she served at ch as Chief Resident at Emory, and then did a fellow, uh, fellowship in cornea external disease and refractive surgery also at Emory. Um, she then went on to perform a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, Master of Science in Health and Healthcare Research at the University of Michigan, uh, where she now uh, serves as, um, like I said, the service chief. Um, her research interests include e-health and anterior eye diseases, microbial keratitis, and corneal transplantation, especially um, focused on eye bank practices. She's been well-funded over her career and currently um, is PI on a more than a $2 million NIH grant um, and serves as a co-PI on another $2 million NIH grant. Um, she has many honors and awards um, of note. She's won teaching awards from the residents and medical students multiple times over several years. Um, she's been selected as having the best paper of a session at the American Society of Cataract Refractive Surgeon um, twice. Um, she's received the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award. Uh, she's been in the Arvo Leadership Development Program for Women. Um, she's been on the Biomedical Innovation Cup at the University of Michigan and the Colleen Conway Grace MD Lectureship um, at the University of Maryland. Also uh, involved in health policy leadership development um, in the, at the Cornea Society. She serves on multiple editorial boards and committees um, of note. Uh, she's on the Faculty Career Advisory Committee at the University of Mich Michigan, the Health Services Research Group at, in the Department of Ophthalmology, uh, Kellogg Eye Center for E Health, um, like I said, she's the strategic director there, and currently serves as the fellowship director of the Corneal External Disease Program. Nationally, she serves on multiple Academy, um, American Academy of Ophthalmology um, services, such as the iWiki Editorial Board, the Telemedicine Task Force, the Ophthalm Ophthalmic Advocacy Leadership Group of the Cornea uh, Society representative. Um, she serves on as a board member on the Cornea Society, the American Academy of Ophthalmology Council Leadership with a subspecialty specialized section and the section nominating committee. She also has a four year appointment at the Food and Drug Administration, um, looking as an advisory committee of the dermatologic and ophthalmic drugs. Um, and she's presently a, an uh, a member on the JAMA Ophthalmology Advisory Committee. She has nearly 100 published papers in high impact journals, 10 book chapters, two patents, more than 90 national presentations, 30 invited national talks, as well as many didactic and national teaching awards. She is truly a rising star in her field. We're a, it's a pleasure to have her here today speaking about novel strategies to assess corneal ulcers in 2021. Thank you, Maria. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, Dr. Wozniak and I met because she's W-O-Z and I'm W-O-O. -O, and so we were put next to each other thanks to alphabetical, um, you know, luck. And um, which is also actually how I met my husband whose last name starts with a W. So you got to Sometimes the, the alphabet, alphabets help you out. So we, we established a friendship and really then a collaboration, which I'll speak a little bit to. But it really is an honor to speak to you today. And thank you for everyone for your time on a Friday afternoon. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I'm going to be talking today about novel strategies to assess corneal ulcers in 2021. Um, and my email address is there um, for contact information. In terms of um, Disclosures, uh, our university does get um, grant support from the National Eye Institutes and Research Blindness for my research. Um, so just as an overview, I want to talk um, sort of in, in, in 
a little bit of context to talk to you about why I sort of went into the area of interest that I have, um, and then tell you a little bit about telemedicine in front of the eye research that I've done. Um, and then I'll do, do a little bit of um, data insights where I had this sort of pause and some decisions to make and where I was going to go with the directions of my research. And then what we're up to now, um, image analysis for corneal ulcers. And um, hopefully this will um, kind of just sort of tell the story of um, where the space is for uh, anterior eye telemedicine and um, anterior eye imaging a bit. So just for context, um, you know, why, why, did I, why did I go down this pathway? Um, well, I really became interested in e-health as sort of a popula for populations of patients. Um, I loved helping the patient right in front of me, but I had a hard time rationalizing that the patient in front of me got lucky enough to see, you know, a cornea specialist while there were so many people out there suffering uh, needless blindness um, from the various diseases. And some of that started because I, you know, worked in a county hospital, although this is not me, it looks a lot like me. And, you know, these patients are lining the hallways of the county hospital to be seen. Um, and I also knew that we had huge potential impact as an ophthalmologist. This is a very young version of me. And this is one of my first cataract surgery patients. So I did an extra cap on and we got his permission and my senior resident said, hey, let's take a picture together, which was a fortuitous picture because he came back the next week after like, you know, having the big impact of cataract surgery and had shaved himself, um, you know, shaved everything so he could finally see again. So we as ophthalmologists can make a huge impact if the patients can actually get to us. But there's this big mismatch of patients and resources, especially when it comes to pre preventable diseases. And so in my view, it really was that use of telemedicine um, that could potentially change um, the models of care. You know, so right, and this is a slide uh, barred from April Ma, who runs a big telemedicine program through the VA. Um, but I really wanted to be able to use telemedicine resources to take these basic eye services and remove them from our in-person care um, so we could really focus on both advanced and intermediate diseases um, as ophthalmologists, really, you know, operating at the, uh, and optometrists, operating at the highest level of our, um, of our licensure, really to be, um, seeing medically complex and surgically complex patients and not seeing the bread and butter things that telemedicine could really help us um, evaluate for screening purposes and also for monitoring purposes. And, you know, there's a lot of cool technologies out there <laughs> and you can find pictures, but really I was impressed with all of the advancements for uh, retinal diseases um, that you could really uh, put a lens on portable technologies and be able to see the fundus. Um, and I was getting emails from patients. So this is a patient of mine who couldn't afford to see me. So he would send me these pictures of his corneal transplant. And I mean, I would always write these very couched emails back, but you know, it's actually not that bad a picture. Like you can kind of see a little bit what's going on. Um, but I wanted to see if we could really use these technologies for screening for anterior eye diseases. Um, so that led to sort of a investigations with um, anterior segment um, diseases and using e-health to screen for anterior segment diseases with a future application really focused on emergency rooms and just general eye screening uh, scenarios where patients were already being screened for posterior segment diseases um, like diabetes. Um, so this was a two-part um, project where we looked at uh, simple things, right? So it was very important for me that e-health could be distributed. Um, we, there's a lot of fancy technologies that all of us as ophthalmologists love, but they're very hard to distribute. So it was important to me to look for low cost um, tools that could be used in low resource environments. So the first obvious one is just questionnaires. Like, can we ask patients questions um, to then see if they have anterior eye diseases? And that study really came to the conclusion that yes, there were some key questions that we could focus on and, and provide our colleagues in primary care around pain, blurred vision, eye redness, and glare that really might indicate the presence of anterior segment disease and focus that conversation with the patients to be able to triage people appropriately to eye, uh, eye, eye providers. The other half of um, that investigation was using imaging. Um, so could we use portable technologies to examine the front of the eye and detect uh, anterior eye diseases? And so my colleagues in retina who um, ran diabetic retinopathy programs were very eager for, the, for this project because they you know, take a lot of 
front of the eye photos. And you can just with a single external shot pick pick up some diseases, but the question is, is how good a job were you doing? And was that a valid way to really screen for your anti eye diseases? Um, so we performed a study of um, close to 200 patients, uh, 200 eyes from 110 patients in our cornea and comprehensive services. And these are patients with um, corneal diseases such as abrasions, ulcers, pterygia, um, scars, corneal scars, and uh, normal eye controls. And we tested, uh, we tested a bunch of cameras um, and then ultimately looked, uh, evaluated two external portable cameras, uh, the iTouch, which is a variant of the iPhone and the NIDEC VersaCam, which was a, a commercially available um, portable camera at the time, I had no financial interest, um, to, that also had an attachment for the, both the front of the eye and the, um, and the back of the eye and the retina. And so we took images with diffuse white light and fluorescein cobalt blue light. We did not take slit uh, photos. Um, we then had this bank of photos and we had three cornea specialists try to detect disease and see if they on the, on the image could detect disease and what confidence level they had. And really the long story short is that they really were not that great. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we really had a low sensitivity in, um, to detect diseases, which is really the point of a screening tool. Um, and just as a point of reference, the National um, Natural Health Services in the uh, UK really sets the bar at 80% sensitivity and 80% specificity for being able to detect diseases. Now, all of this work was done um, kind of in the uh, 2013, 14, 15. Um, and so that, but that was kind of, that's kind of the gold standard of sort of sensitivity and screening for diseases. Um, and this is some examples of why um, we had these photos. Um, sorry, just let me get my self view out of the way. Um, we had photos of patients' eyes, um, and you could see that maybe in this picture, you could tell something's going on just because there's some conj injection, but you really can't appreciate um, the pathology. This eye does have an ulcer, but you really can't see it because of the, um, you know, biofringence and the, the refraction, um, the, the optics of the, of the cameras. Oh, okay. Um, when we looked at subgroups, um, which were not powered for analysis, but when we just examined subgroups, it did how it did seem that you know pterygium were pretty easy to detect, but ulcers, by and large part, we could also detect with decent sensitivity and, speci uh, and, spe and specificity. This is just a sensitivity analysis for the three graders. Um, but things like corneal abrasions, you would think with the blue light, we'd be able good to detect them, and we really couldn't effectively. Um, and similarly, not, not too surprisingly with corneal scars. So really our conclusions, which were very important, were that um, the smartphone pictures really couldn't be used for general cornea screening of the cornea. And it just could not be validated to do that task. Um, so what do you do when your p-value is above 0.5 essentially? <laughs> <laughs> like, where do you go from here? 0.05 and you, um, you're above 0.05. And what do you do when you sort of get lemons at the end of a study? Um, well, the first thing you do is you have total patience because there is nothing like a global pandemic to make your, your past research relevant. In March of 2020, I have never sent, well, I mean, we were all doing a lot of triage for a lot of decision-making. I have never sent my papers around so far across, across the globe because everyone's like, wait a second, I have to start doing telemedicine immediately. Like, can I do this? Let me read your papers on this. Like what's, po what's possible. And you know, the, the, the running joke, I'm not sure if you've all heard it is that if you're, you're lucky if nine people read the paper that you wrote, like, like that's the the best case scenario is nine people read your papers. And so sometimes it's just a waiting game. You know, if you have an idea and it's an idea that um, you really want to pursue, put it out in the literature, do good work, do good work around it, because someone might have that similar question and issue down the road. And so really it was based on this preliminary work that we were able to publish some smartphone tips for patients and providers about how to um, take the best possible photos of your eye. If you know that your patient's not coming in, we could give people our questionnaires and really help them in that way. Um, but, you know, going back to like this, that that's great for like, you know, 
five years after that, but in 2015, I was like, well, what am I going to do with this information where I, you know, I, you, when you, when you do a big research project, you always think, you know, what the next project is after that. And it's really important to step back and just really look at your data, regardless of whether it's sort of the outcome you expected or not the outcome you expected. But if it's not the outcome you expected, then certainly you have to look at it a little harder. So um, what, what did I gain from this? Well, these are pictures obviously of the retina. And so what I really gained from this is that I was jealous. <laughs> I was jealous of those posterior segment people who had population health screening and for their diseases had a system in place to detect things. And I was also getting jealous because now all of these cool things could be detected with the posterior segment photos. You know, now you can not only detect disease, but you can also detect how old the patient is, what the patient's biologic sex is, what their future stroke risk is, what their future risk of dementia is. Now, some of these things are more recent than 2015, but I knew that there was so much power that was coming through in these images and not only just in the future, but also in the present of to be able to remotely detect diseases to poor populations with relatively low cost technologies. And so I was like, okay, well, why didn't it work for me, right? And I think one of the things I really came to is, you know, well, the anterior segments in three dimensions, right? Yeah, so it was really hard to take accurate photos. And I mean, arguably the retina is too, but you know, the, they sort of let go of macular edema when doing population health screening with photos and had all these surrogates. And so imaging a three dimensional structure is very different with low cost technology. And so the technology I was using really wasn't designed to um, address address questions too, you know, the beauty of diabetes and um, the beauty of ROP screening um, with photos is that you know the baby premature, or you know that the patient has diabetes. So you really are not trying to do this pan screen for multiple diseases. You're really a targeted focused disease. Um, and, you know, the cameras that we were using were not designed for this technology. You know, it was, these cameras are designed for selfies. So the most common question I got after this research is like, well, did you use this macro lens? And did you use this different lighting? Oh, and there's this thing and you can stick it on the, I think that's true. I mean, I, I do think there's optical ways to make smart chrome cameras better, but ultimately, you know, the, the technology was not designed for this use. And so we're jerry-rigging it to, to, to make a better insights. Um, so I was trying to solve too many things. And I was also using screening as sort of this hodgepodge of diagnosis and monitoring disease. And, you know, one thing I realized with, with so many of these diseases is that monitoring is a much safer thing to do than diagnosing. Some, when you, when you're monitoring existing disease, so that you know the person has diabetes, you know it's a premature baby, in some ways you're just monitoring them because you know they have the underlying condition. So similarly in cornea, knowing that they have the underlying condition, whatever condition you choose, and then you're just tracking it over time, it's gonna be a safer technology to at least start with than de detecting disease and diagnosing disease. And when I really thought more fundamentally about why telemedicine did well um, for retina, it's because they had underlining studies that really validated this approach, right? It was really the ETTRS that used this technology as, that used photography as a surrogate for end markers and then correlated that with outcomes that then created the opportunity to then say, wait a second, if these photos are so good for measuring disease severity, can we then use them in a telemedicine setting? And so that was kind of a big aha for me that there was really no building blocks for doing telemedicine for the front of the eye, that we had to build the building blocks in order to then be able to then move um, to, a, to a telemedicine setting. Um, so the decisions I made from there were to start with a very specific and high need population and to really use the most appropriate technology and then simplify once it was robust with the most appropriate technology. Um, so that's how I sort of came to uh, where, where the work I've been now doing um, for the past however many years, since 2015. Um, so, you know, again, getting back to the, the idea of like, you know, what was I seeing in the front of the eye and what was the real question and, and need that we could meet? Um, so one, one of the things that I really appreciated about all diseases in, in ophthalmology also at this time was how much variability there is in what we do. 
Um, there's a lot of variability in clinical measurements and in really um, in, in, in most measurements for um, ophthalmic diseases. But there's known variability in measuring horizontal corneal diameter by hand and trachoma by photographs and IOP by application in people's um, subjective measurement of cup to disc ratios. And also we know that different providers vary greatly in terms of their education and clinical experience and therefore what treatments that they can implement or that they implement as a result. So I wanted to pick a condition that had unmet need um, in anterior segment. And so I really thought that the, the biggest problem area that we still had was microbial keratitis. We had a lot of treatments, but there was a lot of bugs and it's still not quite one disease. There's still a lot of variability there, but it was a highly debilitating disease where there could be a lot of help in guiding treatments and guiding therapies. So monitoring this disease as well as letting the clinician be the one to diagnose it and then give them a decision aid to be able to improve their ability um, to help patients. Um, you know, there was clearly going to be variability um, in in my mind, I knew that there was going to be variability in measuring corneal ulcers. And it was pretty funny because um, I was talking to Dr. Dr. Lee Pauly, my um, chairman about this idea. And he's like, oh, but it's a cornea. It's right there. You can see it. And I'm like, oh man, like that, that's like, it's like throwing down a challenge. He was like, I don't know. I think it's much harder. And I was just like, oh man, that's a posterior segment talking about person talking about the front of the eye, like story of my life. I'm married to retina specialists. So, you know, I was like, no, 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 no. It's just not that easy. Just because you can see it doesn't mean that you can measure it. Um, also, I'd been doing a bunch of chart reviews and we just don't write this stuff down. I mean, we, we don't, you know, I actually ended up doing a study on this. You know, we don't always measure the ulcer features. We're busy, we're running around. So we don't take the time to write in the, the measurements and do the measurements with the calipers. So it's very hard to track patients over time. Um, I also had a history of, um, in my fellowship, um, drawing was really important, um, which is a very much lost art, but these are all drawings that my faculty member made me do of corneas um, during my fellowship. So this is a big part of my fellowship is because we didn't have saline photography readily available. So they wanted very precise drawings and expected this from us. Um, and so I was drawn, I drew a lot. Um, I drew every like, you know, front and cross section. So I had thought a lot about how we describe things lar largely because, you know, it really got bled into me that this was a way to communicate uh, in the chart. Um, and it's a valid point, you know, like th this is a, um, this is the description I pulled um, for this image of the eye. You know, this is how, these are all the words that we use to describe that picture Right. And then even with that picture, you know, how are we going to measure it? Do you measure it long axis, like vertically and horizontally? Like even those words really don't represent the picture as well as the picture does. Right. So um, getting the picture really does highly augment our understanding of the disease. But even the picture, it doesn't have a measurement tool around it. So, you know, really the rationale is, you know, we have these patients who have these severe infections. We often share these patients um, with, uh, with our colleagues. You know, one provider sees them one day, another uh, cornea specialist sees them another day. But we're relying on subjective data, missing data, um, and we're relying on um, tools that really aren't that precise. And so it's very difficult to track patients over time and see if they're truly getting better or truly getting worse. Um, and really, you know, we knew, we also know that phenotypes vary a lot, but you have to assess all of these things together, the um, morphology, the clinical picture, and then decide how bad this patient's disease is. Um, and based on your prior experience, then make a determination for um, what treatment you should do going forward. Well, that's great if you're seeing Dr. Wozniak, um, but if you're, you know, not, if you don't have the opportunity to get to her, you're dealing with a person who doesn't have as much experience as her dealing with corneal infections, you know, really obviously your health will suffer. I mean, this is a universal truth of medicine, just the disparities in health outcomes related to who, you, who you're able to see. Um, so really what I distilled this down to is that I, I thought it'd be important to create a quantified quantified real-time measurements of microbial keratitis features over time for several, um, for several underlying reasons. Not the least of which is being able to standardize how we do things, but also to be able to track things over time. I'm gonna make sure I'm on time. Um, 
So I think, you know, one of the first things I had to do in um, figuring out how to design this study, design a study around this is what is an acceptable amount of variability when you measure a corneal ulcer? Like how much do um, Dr. Wozniak and I vary when we, when we measure this exact same thing on the exact same eye? So first I needed to sort of get a baseline of what was a uh, clinically significant difference and also what is just the baseline variability between providers and within a provider. So what do you do when you're starting something new? You start with pig eyes, right? So we did, we had corneal abrasions. Um, we we um, gave corneal abrasions to pig eyes, um, put fluorescein um, on the eye, and then immediately after fluorescein placement had three separate um, cornea specialists measure the horizontal and vertical diameter of that abrasion. And we did do straight horizontal and straight vertical because we knew there'd be even more variability if we did things at an off axis. Um, and we really found, we found that, you know, we were looking for basically were providers about what was, did there was a statistically significant difference between providers. And there was a statistically significant difference um, over 0.5 millimeters. The mean, like the mean, ab, the mean absolute difference was about 0.5 to 0.8 for a horizontal height and width. And you can see our variability between providers here. Um, however, when we look at this sort of a different way, about 16% or so, some in some cases, 10%, 12% of, um, of us had differences as much as a millimeter between, um, between lengths, uh, either vertical or horizontal lengths. And so there was quite a bit of variability in a very static situation with very little change um, and trying to control for all the variables. So we then took this into the real world and said, well, how much variability is when you actually have live patients? So um, this is my collaborator, Dr. Prajna um, at Arvind Eye Hospitals. For those of you who have not had an opportunity to go, this is a life-changing experience. I highly recommend going um, to just see what uh, population health looks like. Um, for a sense of scale, Arvind Eye Hospital sees more patients than Michigan Medicine sees for all patients. Um, so volume is, <laughs> volume is unbelievable. Um, and so as, as well as their clinical and, um, and, and research expertise. Um, so we conducted a patient probably in about three days because they have so many ulcers that come through. Um, I'm kidding. It took a little longer than that. But we, um, we also did this um, in, in patients where we had three separate clinicians measure ulcer the same patient um, ulcer and seeing what the variability is between them. And again, we used horizontal and vertical length just because it was easier to standardize. And what you can see here, this is a slightly different way of representing it, but what you can see here is the central line of the um, perfect agreement and each of this, the, um, uh, the dotted lines further out is either a 0.5 millimeter difference or a one millimeter difference in measurements. So you can see that um, vertically measuring the ulcers was a little bit tighter and horizontally measuring the ulcers, um, you know, where you have to shift the slit lamp calibers to the side, there was a, a lot more variability there. And this is a similar graph that we had shown last time about um, uh, high, you know, some patients, quite a good percentage of patients having greater than one millimeter variability. So we we started to really say, okay, how do we, what strategies can we use to minimize that variability? So for the same, um, you know, and, and and I will say that you know this is often the point where everyone tells me I should be using OCT, but I thought it was super important to be able to use something that was already available in standard eye clinics and could be distributed and potentially be simplified. Um, I would love to use OCT and portable OCT for this technology, but I wanted something that could be real used in the real world right now for our patients. So in those same 50 patients that we measured with the three ophthalmologists, we also got slit lamp photographs of these patients. And um, a wonderful um, MD-PhD uh, resident uh, um, at Michigan um, helped us to create a random forest um, machine learning algorithm to measure stromal infiltrate and epi defect size. And then we assess the variability. And the way that this, uh, this software works is you uh, draw a circle within the stromal infiltrate, and then you also draw a separate circle outside of the stromal infiltrate. So in this case down here, you can see the red circles are 
part of the ulcer, part of the eye that is not the stromal infiltrate, deliberately including the hypopion. So the algorithm knows like that's not part of the stromal infiltrate. And then the algorithm builds out to the borders. Um, so we had three separate ophthalmologists trace the stromal infiltrate and then trace outside the stromal infiltrate. So we had, you know, same, same ulcer patient, three people examining them in person, three people looking at the same photograph, but measuring it differently. Um, we could have done a thousand more different ways to look at variability, but these are the main two we looked at. And so what you can see here is this is what you've seen before about the variability between examiners. And as we look at either manually tracing these images compared to our semi-automatic method. So if we actually take the photos and hand trace the stromal infiltrate, there's more precision um, in that measurement. And then um, again, even more precision if you use a semi, if three separate people use a semi-automated algorithm. So really this gave us hope that obviously that um, precision is really possible um, with newer techniques in image analysis, which is what led to our current research study, um, which is called the AQUA study, which stands for Automated Quantitative Ulcer Analysis Study. And just, um, these are my collaborators and my team. I work with Sina Farsu, who is a deep learning image analysis expert at Duke, uh, Dr. Prajna, who you've seen a picture with, um, Dr. Karandeep Singh, who's a bioinformatics specialist. Um, my study, um, um, sorry, my, my biostatistician, Leslie Nizzle, Mercy Powar, and um, Miriam Khan as the main members of the team. And so, you know, really what is our goal here? Um, for the, for the purposes of this grant, I thought it would be that the, the best way to start using this tool would be to say, okay, can we develop a tool that can standardize the way that we measure ulcers so ultimately we can start to tailor treatments for the eye and so we can track disease over time. You know, I think that sometimes we see a patient two days later and we can say, okay, yeah, they're getting better. You see a patient a week later or two weeks later or three weeks later, you've seen a lot of patients in between. And can we really um, communicate better within ourselves and to our, uh, and with colleagues as we share patient to really standardize the way that we measure ulcers and then be able to use that information to improve um, technologies and treatments and also be able to have a tool and also to have a tool um, to use for comparative treatment trials. Um, and so we are now recruiting for a prospective observational study that um, tracks patients and takes photos of them over 90 days. Um, and we're collecting many features, um, not the least of which is slit lamp photographs, um, but also clinical information and clinical symptoms. I still think that it's very important to look at healing in terms of what the patients are saying to you. Um, you know, patients will report improvement in pain, and these are very important factors that, that really do communicate health, and um, we should not ignore that and just go all image-based. There's a lot of learning from listening to the patient in front of you. Um, and so we're recruiting patients with microbial keratitis that are not minuscule, um, that are um, 15 years and older. Um, we take now four photographs of the eye. Um, we were starting with just the white, white light and blue light photos, but we do want to see how we can do with um, looking at ulcer depth and ulcer thinning. So we use this, get a slit beam, beam photo. And we also take sclerotic scatter photos because they so delineate the borders of the ulcer so nicely. Um, and I think that'll be a complement to the image analysis tool. Um, so we've started, um, we have a preliminary database that we've been collecting for quite some time. So we've started um, segmenting uh, the images in that database by manually tracing uh, images and then feeding them to a neural net that we um, have developed um, with some very promising early results. And this neural net looks at, um, the current one that we have is just looking at the diffuse white light photos and the blue light photos. And what you can see here is um, some representative photos looking at our preliminary algorithm. Um, the panels on the left are our manual tracings of these um, of the various uh, morphologic features, um, stromal infiltrate, white blood cells surrounding. Um, it's not represented in this photo because, but other photos have uh, corneal edema, the hypopion. We have to trace light, re light reflexes, um, the pupil, which is not in this photo either because it's obstructed by the stromal infiltrate, and the corneal limbus. Um, and we do the corneal li limbus so we have a sense of size of the actual ulcer and be able to track between images. And this is another representative photo, again, with the panels on the left, our manual tracing on the panel on the right with our preliminary algorithm. 
Um, and um, this is our this is our preliminary results. I'm laughing because um, my collaborator, Sina Farsu, who does a lot of this, was like, these are perfect results for preliminary data. They're good, but they're not so good. They, they show promise, but if you have results too good, then you can't get the grant either because you're already too good. So, so this is our preliminary algorithm based on just um, about 50, 60 eyes. And, um, we are, these are what are called dissimilarity coefficients, which the easiest way to think about it is it's the amount of overlap of the Venn diagrams, right? So you have two different, um, we had our manual tracing and our automatic tracing, and it's the amount of overlap. Perfect overlap would have a dice uh, correlate, a coefficient of one, um, and then zero would be no overlap. So 0.7 and above is considered very like good uh, overlap. So for some things we're very good, uh, the algorithm is performing very well compared to our manual tracing, and there's others that are room for improvement. Um, but now I want to also, so now we're in this data collection phase. So what do you do when you're in the middle of a grant, but the final, the final stuff is not in? Well, you do side projects. And I wanted to highlight something that I'm working on with Dr. Wozniak. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to keep it um, uh, pretty brief. But we, um, we were at this poster session and chatting away, um, arranged by alphabetical order. And, you know, there's not... There's not a ton of people in the microbial keratitis corneal space who do really applied science. And so we struck up a conversation about her research and my research, and we had this wonderful insight um, that um, so much of what we do, um, even in the basic science sphere, has some subjectivity to it. And is there a way to improve standards um, in that space as well? Um, and you know, I, I don't, I really don't need to go through this with you, um, but we decided to focus on the area that Dr. Wozniak focuses on, um, staph aureus infections for bacterial uh, keratitis. And really what um, she led me to realize, which I did not do because I stay very far away from mice. Um, I used to work with mice, but no longer, um, is that the murine models for bacterial keratitis were very well established, but all of the severity grading is subjective. And really the main, another, um, you either subjectively rate, grade the, the corneas and the severity of the keratitis of the, by the stromal infiltrate and other parameters, or you quantify the bacterial burden within the tissues after homogenizing them. Um, so the bacterial keratitis clinical severity grading is from this 1987 paper that sort of gives it a four point scale. And there's been other scales that have developed since then, but that's the main one that's used. And then indirectly people use uh, the burden, the colony forming units, uh, the bacterial burden as a way to measure disease severity. So we wanted, we are starting to explore if we can use a more objective me method to measure keratitis severity. Um, so we looked at um, Dr. Wozniak was, did slit lamp photos um, of the mouse, the mice eye, the mouse eyes, murine eyes, and after infection, and then they had clinical gradings of the severity as well as um, the bacterial burden. So then we took those slit lamp photographs and we manually annotated them. So we traced the borders of the infiltrate to see if there was a correlation between. Um, what we could see based on the photographs and the clinical severity grading and the colony forming units. Um, just so you have a sense of the scale, we had about 20 eyes that we included in the sub-study with a pretty decent distribution between severity gradings um, of the, um, on the clinical severity score. Um, and so this is our preliminary results. What you can see, which is very interesting in my opinion, is that the Bacterial burden um, did correlate very well with the clinical severity grade that, um, that their lab measured. Um, and the sort of stromal infiltrate that we measured um, by manual tracing also correlated with bacterial burden. But even though it was a positive correlation, it's a pretty flat um, curve here for the clinical severity grading in the stromal infiltrate area that we measured, um, you know, that we measured um, from the slit lamp photographs. So, you know, we, we saw, sh showed strong correlations here, but really the severity grading and the measurements of the stromal infiltrate are like, there was not a significant p-value. So there's a weak positive correlation, which I think is my theme of my life, which is variability strikes again. And where is it coming from? Like, this is where the money is. Like 
it's fun to get good p values, but why you don't get good p values when you expect to have good p values is always where the science lies. Like chase the bad p value is I think the theme of, of my career and figure out why that's going on. So this is the stage that we're at now. There's a thousand different parameters that um, are difficult to control from taking the photographs, from the way that we measure them, from holistically using a severity score that might vary by the person grading it. So um, uh, Dr. Wozniak and I are learning this together and it's an exciting area um, because really ultimately what we hope to do is be able to then use um, human to um, mouse um, uh, translational work, right? So I'm collecting specimens of human eyes. I'm taking photos of human eyes. We are now sending those specimens to Dr. Wozniak and now she has the ability to then use those exact same um, specimens in her models. And we'll, I think we'll learn a lot about this sort of, um, you know, basic science to clinical science correlation and also have this ability to measure things in a uniform way. Um, the, other, the other area that we've been working on um, is um, what else can we do with this data? So I showed you this picture already. We have multiple um, pathologic features that we're measuring and non-pathologic features that we're measuring. And what we decided to do is for each of these pathologic features, we have um, we decided to evaluate each of those features with a, a couple different approaches, um, whether the feature was present, the size of the feature in a couple different ways, how yeah, three different ways, and how central that feature was. And um, so now we have each of these features of the cornea and ways, different ways of evaluating those features of the cornea. And as a first pass with the data that we have, we, we thought to ourselves, well, how well does that correlate with the person's vision, their current vision, not their future vision, but their current vision? And it was really interesting. So not too surprisingly, the size, the when you take all of those measurement parameters um, and you um, plug them into a machine learning model, um, the highest correlation with visual acuity is the stromal infiltrate. But if you combine these features, even these very, even including the sort of lower, um, lo less correlating features, the combined features are even have a stronger correlation with the patient's current visual acuity. In both both if you base the, this on the, the manual tracings or the automatic, our algorithms tracings. Um, and then, um, hold on, send, is that chat for me? Um, oh, I can answer that later. Um, so, oh wait, now I'll see, now I gotta hide the chat. All right, there we go. Um, so then we, we looked at this. We looked at this a different way, and we plugged all the um, regions of interest with their measurements of interest into a support vector machine prediction algorithm. And we were basically able. We were basically well. We were able to predict the person's vision with with very good correlation. So this is the x-axis is the person's true visual acuity and logmar scale. And then our algorithms predicted visual acuity based on the measurements on the, on the slit lamp photo that we generated with our automatic or the manual and then the automatic segmentation. And so you can see that we're pretty, pretty good at predicting someone's visual acuity. I mean, 0.8 correlation. Um, we're pretty good at predicting their visual acuity based on our algorithm. And this is pretty exciting, you know, to be able to take a photo and tell somebody, tell you what that person's vision is with a pretty strong correlation, I think has a lot of potential impact um, and we'll, we'll see where this takes us. Um, but, but to be able to sort of see that sort of structure function uh, correlation um, is exciting and the right direction for this work, so. So, you know, I think that the take home point is that we were able to create this algorithm based on slit lamp photogra photographs and then really to be able to determine what the person's current visual acuity is, which is exciting. Um, so I want to stop there because I want to make sure we have time for questions, but I have so many people to thank. Um, this is a team sport science. I, I really only like to work in teams. I'm sort of over the N of one. I just, I can talk to myself all day. I have no interest in doing that. So the collaboration with Dr. Wozniak has been amazing. I've learned so much. Uh, my collaborators at Duke are amazing, at India are amazing, and really, of course, the home team of both the Kellogg family, of all, all of my colleagues in Cornea, and uh, my mentors and work colleagues, all the study coordinators, thousands of students, trainees who've helped so much, and then, of course, my home team. 
um, my two kids, um, um, Lewis and Craig and my husband, Jeremy, retina specialist who uh, keeps me honest. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and um, you know chat about this. Well, thank you so much, Maria. That was fabulous and really um, appropriate with um, what's going on in the world, trying to reach more populations. Uh, so I applaud that work. Um, let's open it up for um, discussion. Do you want to answer the chat question about the pupil dilation? Did that matter? Uh, do you think that will improve the imaging if you have a better pupil dilation or does that not matter? I don't think it matters because of the ulcer. You know, I think, I think because of the ulcer, it's just, it's all about, it's all about the ulcer. It, it has been very, you know, it's, it's humbling actually to really see the difference in the photos from the US from the US versus India because the India photos like these patients I guess they're just used to a higher threshold of pain but um, they the, the eyes are very wide you know we we had a, a hard time we had to do a lot of learning about how to take a good photo of someone who's in a lot of pain with ulcers and giving them topical numbing but I don't think pupil has been a problem for us. One of the questions that uh, sort of dovetails into <clears throat> what Dr. DePaulis was getting at is. Um, can you talk a little bit about the methodology, um, the process of coming up with your, your, I guess, standards for imaging? Um, I do plastics, and so as a consequence, it's always fascinating to me how much the positioning can end up fundamentally impacting um, the observations that we make. Uh, was it an iterative process? Did you, um, you know, have you figured it out? <laughs> Yeah, it's very iterative. And I would say that we've not figured it out. And um, I mean, we have and haven't, right? So we have weekly image review meetings with our photographer. We, we, we did multiple different iterations. We did multiple protocols. Really the tricky thing was blue light because everyone like fills the blue light differently, um, which is very interesting. And unfortunately, like, op like ophthalmic photography is getting to be a less, like a, less of a skill set that is available. Um, you know, people are getting more OCTs. They're not using ophthalmic, especially anterior segment of ophthalmic photography. So there was a lot of like sort of cracking of the knuckles and retraining with our photographers. Um, but we spent a lot of time doing image review and have a standard protocol and have multiple sample images um, and, you know, talk a lot about depth. Luckily, we, um, you know, we have ways to work around depth and lighting issues with machine learning um, and, you know, image analysis. Um, but I, I still think about that a lot. And this is why we literally review images weekly um, because standardization is so hard in that space. This, the slit lamp helps us too, because obviously it fixates one person. Um, you know, the, uh, the portable technology was crushing for fix, like keeping people still. But it's, it's, it's a huge issue. And, you know, you know, I, I try my optimist in me says, well, if we can deal with the variability and still make something good, that actually is much more translatable to the real world. Um, but of course, like, you know, doing something well in as much controlled fashion as your way to then make it you know, then, like I said, go back to sort of more real world environments or that efficacy versus effectiveness issue for all studies. Mia, yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you so much, uh, by the way, for being here. It's awesome to see you. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, and yes, I agree. The world of uh, kind of microbial keratitis and cornea is small. So <laughs> hopefully we can recruit some of our residents or future residents uh, into the field. Um, one thing I, I had thought about kind of with what you're working on is how do you envision sort of connecting like the, the patient background, like they're a diabetic, they're immunocompromised, they even social circumstances, like how does that like kind of play into your framework and how you think about like yep. what you're doing? Um, so uh, we just hired a postdoc in our lab who's a health disparities researcher. Um, which is easier for me to get my head around than mice. <laughs> so like you can tell like, I was emotionally traumatized by mice at some point in my life, but it is huge, right? All of my work around adherence and patient care, like we, we do very thorough studies of patients, but you really can't get to social determinants of health because so much of the pathology that we see, you know, you know I, comparative treatment trials will really help us. But unless that patient takes the drug or they show up in the first place and they don't wait two months and they say, oh, I, I, don't, I can't afford to actually get this problem treated with, we're never actually going to help the patients who are in these situations in the first place. It's been fascinating to look at the, as you know, like the, the population of people who get advanced glaucoma, who get 
severe ulcers, who get severe diabetic retinopathy, the, probably the biggest impact that we can make in their disease trajectory is to look at the social determinants of health, right? So to look at their communities, look at their um, other burdens. And so we are going to start studying that more, um, more in a more targeted way, because the impact is probably there in terms of potential policy changes and potential for um, helping them get in the door in the first place. So I, I think it's huge and I think it's uh, unexplored. Um, there's a lot more research in other non-ophthalmology. So there's a lot that we can leverage from other disciplines to learn about behavior change, but also like, you know, practically understanding where patients are coming from. There's a question in the chat box from Ron Plotnick. Are there plans to correlate ulcer morphology with treatment response to specific interventions? Absolutely. I mean, I think that this tool in and of itself, you know, I think it could help measure disease severity, but, you know, so can the clinician, right? So I think the real um, use of this technology will be comparative treatment trials. Ultimately, um, looking at disease trajectories for different bugs um, and looking at disease, different disease tra trajectories for different treatments, right? Um, and so I, I think that will be the potential application. We're also going to sort of look at it upstream of um, once we have this suite of uh, photographs, we'll be able to look at towards, and that's what our RPB grant is on is sort of diagnosing what type the bug is, you know, first big picture, bacterial, fungal, polymicrobial, um, and then sort of drilling down on what the specific bug is, because we really are shooting from the hip. I mean, I don't know, Dr. Wozniak, if you can comment, but our culture return rate is low. And so we're really treating empirically um, most of the time. So we're looking both upstream at how we can diagnose things using image analysis and clinical information, and then downstream comparative treatment trials. That's a good question. How do you plan to distribute the cameras um, to capture the population? Yeah, I mean, I think I think at first we'll just do to ophthalmology optometry places that already have um, a slit lamp camera. Um, the software is um, can will be able to you. I mean, this is the beauty of the disruptive technology of our generation, right? So we will be able to sort of develop software platforms that either integrate with an EHR or you can upload a photo and get your maybe I I expect some clinical core clinical information as well. Um, and between those two things, you know, be able to, um, um, you know, then distribute it to ophthalmologists. And then as you move forward, like the hope is then, of course, you could use, go back to my roots, you know, use some smartphone photos um, in sort of triage rural settings and make decisions. But most of eye care just isn't going to happen that way. You know, most people with eye infections are going to be seen by a provider who's going to have some sort of technology. Maybe it is just a smartphone because you actually also have to get drug to them. So it can't just be like a person does selfie at home um, because they don't have access to what, drug. I mean, well, potentially maybe I'm limiting my thinking, but, um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's why I sort of went with slit lamp photography. I think OCT has huge advantage in terms of precision, but I can't figure out, I haven't seen I've seen ideas on how to distribute it, but practical reality, that's pretty far away. Imagine them sending you the picture, the GPS maps, the location, it goes to their local pharmacy and the pharmacy delivers the drug based on the yeah. picture of the patient. Well, I, I'm a big believer in like doctors. And so I, I hope this will be a decision aid. <laughs> Me too, um, for a few more years at least. Yeah, well, to, well I, have a long, I, I have a little bit more to last. So I, it, I, it's gotta be a decision aid because it is the conversation about adherence. It is the education. It is the human touch. Like, you know, it is, what is this? And like, I don't think we'll ever, I, I my intention is never to pull us out. And I don't think we will. I really just, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I think Silicon Valley just doesn't understand the complexity of what medicine really is. Because Lord knows we're not just looking at the patient and giving him a drug and walking away. There's so much more to it than that. And so I hope this will be a decision aid, not a physician replacement tool. That's what I envision. Agree. Let's see, there's a, a chat question from Scott McRae. Do some of the drug companies have an interest in improving methods to measure ulcer treatment progression? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the answer will be yes. I mean, the, you know, 
this is why we have Dr. Wozniak, right? This is drug development, right? So this is how do you test a new drug f- quicker, faster, cheaper, right? It's very hard to say like my treatment is A is better than B unless you have very standardized measurements, right? So drug development precision really helps with your, your sample size, right? So if you have a more precise measurement, you're much more able to use that precision to argue that drug A is better than drug B. And then all of a sudden your drug trial is a lot cheaper um, because you don't need as many patients to recruit to be able to prove you know, equivalence or, F or, um, or, or better. Yeah, and I think also the power of, of that is you know, what we're doing with the mice in correlation. If we can show that they're similar, you know, that our outcomes are similar both in human and the mice, now all of a sudden we can get much more, I don't know, kind of oomph behind our results from our animal studies as well because it's been validated and correlated with humans as well. So I think there's some there's some real value there, and um, yeah, it's it's hard. If, you know, a keratitis drug trial, as I'm learning all about. Um, you know, we are you're kind of beholden to the subjective opinion of of the observer, right, of of the doctor, and and often, as you've shown, they tend to roughly correlate. You know, to disease progression and severity, but um, having something that's validated and you know sort of proven, I think, would be just of tremendous value. It'd be awesome. Less error around the mean. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah, we um, just as a comment, you know, we with the dysphotopsias and the post IOL issue that I was talking about before, the FDA came to us because they wanted a validated questionnaire because all the companies had different question, you know, they had different questionnaires. So they wanted a validated, one single validated questionnaire. And meanwhile, the companies were eager to do that because they also were having all this, you know, variability or <laughs> ambiguity in terms of when they would present to FDA, how valid would they consider their subjective responses? So having those photographs of, of uh, having a picture of Halo right. driving in Meliora Hall or around Meliora Hall that gives that if that's validated and it's standardized then everybody wins right Um, right. so so the drug companies may be you know fda the drug people at fda may be interested in asking the companies to all chip in that's essentially what happened with this study Hmm. and they get a validated system that everybody agrees on basically so well, I'm always happy to take more money, so I'll, <laughs> I'll talk to Wiley Chambers and tell him to right. <laughs> vote for Mia. <laughs> it's like vote for no, but I, 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 not to not to joke around. I totally agree with you because ultimately we want the money to be going to the drug discovery and the research behind the true science, not the my you know not the, but it's super important to make it clear and accurate and really prove that it's valid. So creating standardized tools really are the building blocks for that great science, right? So you can compare apples to apples. Right. Excellent. Let's see, anybody else? Well, Maria, absolutely pleasure, uh, pleasurable session this afternoon. I just like to see if you can see this plaque. Oh, thank you so much. In, in memory of your presentation, the Falma Institute, University of Rochester, distinguished visiting professors presented to Maria Woodward on May 21st, 2021. We'll be sending you this in the mail. And I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today and participating. It was a great afternoon for science. And just to remind everybody on the third Friday in June, June 18th, we'll be hosting uh, Car- um, Carla Siegfried from WashU and, um, d- d- spot- and the spotlight by Rick Libby in the basic science for our next session. So thank you all for attending today. We'll see you next month. Have a great weekend. <laughs>